anyone else wish to speak? Hearing now, I'll move on to regular council information items. Capital improvement plan, water treatment facility, review, SEA. Hello, um, I'm Karen Pack with SCH. Um, just going to give you a little background about me. Because I don't think a lot of you know me real well, but um, about 25 years ago, this was one of the first plants I did. I worked at Bonus Joe at the time. Um, I was working in Mexico, Peace Corps volunteer, came back here, worked a, <clears throat> another year or so in Mexico, and then um, I started doing lime softening about 20 some years ago. So this is kind of a baby to me because. I love lime softening, and this is one of the first ones I ever did. So to be here and be able to do this is just a real honor. So um, I'm going to take you kind of through the plant and describe the, um, the, the different processes, the evaluation of them, and recommendations for improvements. Um, the last major improvement was about <coughs> 20 years ago when we stood up here, <laughs> and we went through this. And so it's kind of neat, 20 years later, it's very typical, a 20-year cycle for for major plant work for both water and wastewater. So I'm now with SDH, we've been for about four and a half years, um, and lime softening is what I love, and that's what this facility the water treatment plant is. So I'm going to kind of walk you through, and if you have questions, um, you'll please ask. And uh, just to give you a little background, <clears throat> when we started doing this, we wanted to just do a general review of the entire facility, all the different treatment um, processes at the plant, and take a snapshot of time. What is the condition? How is it operating? Um, is it because of age we need to replace it, or is it because of technology, or new requirements are coming up for treatment water qualities? So all these items were looked at. We identified deficiencies and improvements needed, and then we looked at recommendations. How can we fix this? What's the most cost-effective way for you to get the biggest bang for your buck? And long-term, we don't want to do that. That typically ends up costing a lot more. <laughs> and then what we did is we, we took a look at the costs um, for all of these different options, and for several of these, we did look at other <coughs> alternatives and tried to do the one that's going to be best fit for the city. And then we looked at phase, and we want to make sure that this is something that can be done. <coughs> when you look at, at a water treatment plant, it's one of your largest facilities for the city to operate and to maintain. Um, water and wastewater are two really big items for our community. The other thing we did too, we went through this, and we did a chemical analysis. So we went through theory, like, theory, theory as to what should you be feeding for chemical, and what are you actually feeding for chemical? And that we were able to identify, is there any way that we can do some improvements, do some tweaking? And we had John Thome, who we've worked with, he's been in the industry for over 40 years, come out and spend some time with the operators and tweak the chemicals to optimize the operation out there. And what we really spent our time on is the main process units, looking at duration, uh, recard, that photo looks really there. Um, and then there's different chemical feed systems. Um, you recently just redid the lime feed system. But you have lime, you have alum, polymer, um, you have a recarb system. So there's quite a number of systems that are chlorine and fluoride. So we took a look at each of the different chemical feed systems. We looked at how our solids managed. Um, as you clean up the water, you have lime sludge and you have iron sludge. How is that dealt with? Looking at the sedimentation, filtration, and then these waste streams where they sent how they handle. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm <laughs> just getting over a cold. <laughs> so, so we looked at the very beginning of the plant where the water first comes from the wells um, into the facility. It's a 20 inch line that comes in, and one of the things we notice is that there is an influent flow meter. Um, each well has a flow meter, but the flow meter and the influent line coming to the plant is a 20 inch diameter um, that has been defunct for a number of years. And in the past, that flow meter was used for doing your chemical feed. Everything was flow paced off the water coming in that meter. It's been changed now so that it's off of the individual meters so as a well runs they're totaled together. Um, if this is you know modified or, or we have this is an area where you can kind of just like check to make sure that you have a meter that's off somewhere else. It's just a, a double check. Right now the way it's working it's working fine. You don't have to do anything not a high priority. But a lot of times the community would like to just to make sure they have a double check in case the meter does go out somewhere else they can full pace off another meter and this is what you're going to put for the other thing we noticed um, when we were here, we were able to see into that 20 inch pipe that was open at the time. And um, inside there was a lot of buildup, and it's an iron buildup. And at first you weren't sure where in the world was this coming from. And then as time went by, we found out that um, 
there is some bacteria in the aquifer, and it's that iron bacteria, and I'm sure you're aware there needs to be one of the wells. Well, that iron bacteria creates a sludge, and so as it's pumped, it's also delivered to the water plant. And so the raw water lines have that iron sludge in there. It's not detrimental to anyone, it's not hazardous, it's not harmful, but what it does do is it restricts the flow um, of the water through the pipes, it creates a head, so now your, your well pumps aren't as efficient, they're pumping against more head, <clears throat> so they can't be as efficient, they pump less water. So one of the things we did look at is, down the road, if you, know, if you cannot get that iron bacteria under control, an option is to have that line clean. And so we have provided the staff with a method to clean it um, through aeration. We actually go to the well pump, put air into the line, compressed air, and have that bubble up, and it actually creates a scouring effect, cleans the whole line out, and then we have to repipe it so we go into, we're looking at the clarifier. It's a big sedimentation tank, and that way we'd be able to settle it out, send the sludge to the lagoons, because we have the pump system there, and then the de decanted water could go through the facility. So that's a backup plan if we can't get the um, iron bacteria under control, but I think there's been progress in that. And then one of the things we did look at, right now that's a 20 inch diameter um, line, and our meter on that is also 20 inch diameter. And that went in 19, 1972 is when that line went in, that meter went in the mid 90s. Um, we looked at the flows through there. If you did replace that meter, I'd go with a smaller size, go with a 14 inch, it's a little bit cheaper, and you're gonna get a better velocity through there, so it'll be actually recording better. It'll be in the, in the range of the meter that we need to do the proper calibration. After the water leaves the metering, it goes into um, what's called an aerator. And basically the inside of that is just a bunch of holes and the water just percolates down, it's aerated. And what that does is it, it creates the iron, it makes it into a particulate form, so it becomes a solid so you can remove it. Um, that aerator is original to the plant, so 1972, so it's over 40 years old. Um, we are recommending that that does get replaced. We've opened up several of that age um, not that long ago and we found the insides are completely caked and we start cleaning that out, the insides just fall apart. They're so deteriorated because of all that aeration and just the environment, very wet, very humid, and corrodes. So right now, we know that that aerator probably has a lot of plugging going on too because we can't get it up to its full capacity. It's rated for um, 35 to 3,700 gallons per minute. It can do about 3,200 gallons per minute for about 10 hours and then it starts to overflow and flood the roof out there. It just can't keep up, it can't process it through. So for that, we are recommending um, within the next couple years that that does get replaced. One of the nice things about the aerator is it decreases your, your amount of lime, chemicals that need to be added, and then also for chlorine, because of air rates, you don't have to add chlorine ahead of the, the um, clarifier. So it saves you money for your chemical addition, it reduces that. So it's a very efficient system, um, it has a little, I think it's a three-quarter horsepower motor on it, and that's about it. So operation's very easy. And I think it's been cleaned once in 40 years. And I was here when they did it 20 years ago, and <laughs> it's, a, it's a mess to do it. Um, you have iron everywhere. So. Um, one of the other items we looked at was the splitter box. The splitter box, after the water's aerated, it splits into two different um, channels and then what that does it goes to a clarifier one for each clarifier and the clarifiers are just big settling tanks they allow the solids to settle out so all those iron particulates that we form they settle to the bottom of the tank and the clarified water moves downstream through the process this um structure the, the one on the right we call it the burping the burping uh, splitter box because there's so much force pulling it through it pulls air down the air clogs the pipe and then it burps up and so one way to stop that is to put a 14 inch butterfly um, valve on there to control the flow just so that you can slow that velocity down a little bit. So this is something that's not critical, not really needed, but it's just a solution to get rid of that burping. And it also allows you to isolate, you can put on each line to completely isolate because right now it has slide plates which work but they do leak slowly. So when you go in there to paint or to rehab the clarifiers, you still have to deal with a little bit of water trickling in constantly. If you put a valve in there, that'll make it completely watertight. So it's an option to think about not something that you have to enact upon, but something we wanted to point out. The clarifier itself, there's two of them. So after it's been um, aerated, the flow goes up the center of the clarifier, which is a big rectangular um, tank, about 15 to 18 feet deep. And it comes up the top, and you're gonna have the solids that settle to the bottom, and the clear water comes up, and it leaves right through the troughs. And you'll see here, there's these 
radial arms that come out, and there's little holes all the way along it, and so the water flows in, goes to the center brain here, and then it goes out through the carbonation basin. What is happening is that because this is original to 1972 construction, in the mid 90s we did have everything blasted, and it was welded, repaired, and recoded. And it's, it's done fine for the last 20 years. But we are noticing that there is leaking going on again. Some of the welds are, are giving out. And it does need to be rehabbed. So we're looking at in the future here, um, probably in the next three years, this really should be taken care of. It's just going to get worse. It needs to have that coating, that protective layer on there so that we can protect the steel. And right now, um, there are areas where it's just, we're seeing that deterioration. So it is recommended that that um, be handled within the next three years. The recarve system, this is a, a long rectangular tank, and in the very bottom of the tank, these diffusers sit under about 20 feet of water, and they bubble up. Um, it's a CO2, but it's a, it's a gas, not a gas form, it's a liquid form. It's under pressure, it takes the gas, puts it into a liquid form. This was installed again in the mid-90s. It's probably one of the most efficient recarve systems that, that are out there, and so it's working great. Don't replace it, don't change it. It's, it's working very, very nice. One of the things that we did notice when we were going through um, just calculations for dosage is that um, the SCADA system that is out plant, which is it's the computer system that downloads um, all the information for setting feed rates, for opening and closing valves, for recording data, it's the brains of the whole water plant, that it's very antiquated. It's, it's old. It goes back to when I was here the first time. <laughs> And so um, there's been a lot of changes in that time, a lot of reporting changes. This is something that it no longer is communicating correctly with a lot of the chemical feed equipment we found out. So what the operators are seeing on, on the screens isn't actually what's happening. They have to go up to the units and, and correct it. So the data they're getting, they're having to double check um, what they're receiving from this is not correct. And the SCADA system upgrades, that is planned. Um, that was done in another study. I think it's planned for 2018. I don't know it. I kind of want to let you know about it, that we did find that, yeah, that, that study that was done way back, it still holds it. Yeah, that really should be replaced here. As the water leaves the, the repair basin, it goes on to the filter cells. And this is probably the highest priority of the whole facility. Um, that is, it's, um, and detrimental, it gets taken care of fairly soon. Right here, it comes out of the repair basin, the water does. The water flows through this, it's a carbon steel um, flume, and as it goes through here, it drops into a, a steel splitter box that drops into each of the filters. This is extremely corroded. Um, at any time, we can start having the bottom drop out or holes in it. It's, it's very, very thin. And if we look at the splitter box, it's in the same, the flume is back here. This is the box right here that is underneath the walkway. And it splits the flow into each filter cell. Again, this is severely corroded. And the problem is that the flume and the splitter <coughs> box, it's your only source of treatment. You can't bypass and get the water to the other, other um, filters. This is where the water goes through. You can't dry it off enough to blast it and recoat it. And so over the years, it was just left. So for 40 years, the coating has come off. It's been corroding and corroding. Remember 20 years ago, I hit the bottom of that and had a huge chunk fall out on me. And um, I didn't touch it this, this time because <laughs> I was afraid what would happen. And in the very center here, there is a little square. And this drops down about 15 feet. It goes all the way to the bottom of the filters. And at the bottom of that, there are um, waste valves. And those valves, if they open, what happens is the water comes down, wastewater that is, is um, got a lot of the iron and a lot of the, the um, lime. Um, it's, it's the wastewater from cleaning these filters out of the sand. When you do a backwash, the water comes up from the bottom, goes into the trough, and it goes into this pellet. And this pellet empties into here, which goes into your reclaimed basin in the basement. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later on, but this whole area needs to be removed and replaced because it is failing. These valves have never been replaced because you can't get to them. You can't really work on them. And I think you've seen pictures of your anthracite. This is new anthracite. And what you have in your filters is going to give you an idea. Is you have 8 inches of sand at the very bottom. And then you have 18 inches of anthracite on top. And this is a filter to clean your water. And um, 
your filter medium was put in in 97. And this is what it looks like now. So you can see that it's, it's growing. Those, that's the anthracite. So that's the little black stuff you saw. So it's growing probably 20, 30 times is what it used to be. It's, it's just, and what happens when that grows, your media goes up, and then you do a backwash, it starts going into your filter, those troughs, and those troughs wash it into your reclaim basin. And so it goes into the bottom in your reclaim basin. The only way to clean that out is to go in and remove it. So it is, it is an issue. And here I just wanted to show you, I don't know if you can see this, this is looking from the, the walkway down, and you may have seen this picture before. This is what we call a mud ball. I've never seen one this big. Um, Dwayne sent this to me, and I was in shock. It is, it's a good sized mud ball, and when he broke this apart, typically a mud ball is about, about this, I mean, it's pretty small. And what it is, it's all the line holding it together. And when you have this, it's telling me that when you backwash those filters, you're not able to clean them. You're not getting them clean enough, so the, the um, materials start to build up more and more and more. And this is your side effect, is you having these areas in your filter. And you'll start having little ones all over, but this big one happened <coughs> over a hatch where there was very little agitation. And underneath here, you have your anthracite, your sand, and then you have this, this nozzle here. And this is sideways. This is typically be up and down. This is what, these little tiny slots through here, is what your water filters through, and then when you do a backwash, the water comes up the bottom, and it comes out these little slots. You have air come out here for air wash, and you have water come out, clean water, when you're doing a backwash to clean the filters. And there's screws that hold these together, so in between here, you can't see it real well, but there's a lot of light on them. And we were finding buildup, and these, these openings are tiny, so you start getting this buildup, and what happens it starts plugging your nozzles. Now you can't get water through it. And you can't get air through it. And it starts pressurizing it. And in uh, 2000, your media was put in 1997. In 2000, the underdrain was actually blowing up and out due to pressure during the backwash with the air. And at that point, we had to remove all the media, replace the underdrain, the nozzles, and then put the, the sand and, and anthracite back in. So, I just want to stress how important it really is to, to watch that build up of line and to calcification. Um, typically, what we like to see for backwash rates is 10 to 15 gallons per minute per square foot in a filter, and that's the force coming up. Um, your system was designed, it's a gravity system versus a pump system, so it's much less. It's about 8 gallons per minute. Right now, the most we can get through is about 5.5 gallons per minute. And what we see is once you start losing that, the ability to backwash and <coughs> they plug faster. It isn't a straight line, it's, it, it goes up pretty quick. And so what we're seeing here is that you're well into that curve of, of your filters plugging because of all that build up of line. And this is just a, a picture, kind of what I'm explaining is, you know, here we have the water, this is cutting through it sideways, so it's a section view. So right here you have the plume with the water goes through and drops into the gullet here. Right here, um, is, is where you have the water. You have the, the anthracite <coughs> sand, anthracite here, sand here. Then you have uh, just a concrete slab the nozzles stick through. And this is the air here where we have the clean water coming through and when you do a backwash, that clean water reverses and pushes the sand and media up to clean it. And this is a picture of an air wash so the air is really um, vibrating the, the media, trying to get it to clean, agitate itself, and then You'll see that in the next photo is where we have the water wash. And this water then drops into the filter um, monitors. The problem is because we can't get enough flow to really lift those solids, it takes the guys a long, long time to do the wash. And what happens is it fills up the reclaim basin because the reclaim basin is already small. And now they're having to run longer, so it just it's kind of it's like a tail chasing the dog, so to speak. You just can't win. You can't get it clean enough because you don't have the time. And a, a number of years ago, um, the, the overflow for that reclaim, um, when it was first built, went to the Minnesota River. Years ago, that was disconnected. So now if this floods, it floods into the basement of, of the water plant. So we want to make sure we avoid that. And it, it has happened. And the other thing to point out, too, is um, this is the backwash pump. So what it does is it pumps the water into the filters to clean the media. This pump is original to the facility. It's 1972 also, and so are these valves. In the mid-90s, these valves were reseated. 
And at that time, we were told that not be working, and that the next rehab would be replacement. And they are starting to fail. They are leaking, not closing properly. So we do know that we need to, to replace the valves there. And then we also um, are recommending a second pump just for redundancy, because if this goes out, you have no way to clean your filter cells. <coughs> and um, one of the things we did take a look at, what is really ideal is to have a pump system system so that you can control the rate of backwash. You can do a fast wash and a slow wash. So we went through what it would take to change those, make those modifications to the end of your filters. <coughs> and um, we're looking at over a million dollars for the modifications. Just did not feel it was worth it. Just too much money for the benefit you would get. And the other problem was is that those filters are the only filters you have. A lot of times people have two sets of four filters. You don't have that, so you have no redundancy. So to take that out of line means your whole plant is offline. And we just can't do that at this point. But this is something I would definitely think about if the facility were to grow. If you were to go above the 5 MGD that the plant is rated for, if you wanted to do an expansion to 10, at that time, when you put in those new filters, definitely look into a pump set system because it would be a lot cheaper here. We had to include a lot of bypassing and, and trying to figure out how to get water to people. It, it, it's very, very difficult and it's just big, way too risky right now. But in the future, if you were to expand, it's something to definitely think about. And so for the filter rehab, um, what we're recommending is to replace the filter under drain, nozzles, media, and all the other carbon steel components, the plume, the splitter box, the center column, the glue, and then replace the, the influent waste and effluent valves and a private second backwash pump. And then um, there are also some filter drain lines that are outside the facility. They're very close to the building. We recommend to relocate them so they're a little bit easier to operate. Um, that's pretty minor, but this item is a high priority item just because of the condition of the media at this, at this point in the nozzles and the plume. <laughs> um, the other item I talked briefly about was the backwash reclaim tank. Um, the backwash reclaim tank collects all that, that dirty water from the filters. So when they get washed, you're going to see very high iron, very reddish water going in. It's going to have a lot of solids, lime, sludge. It's going to be falling into the reclaim, bank, or reclaim tank, which sits directly below the filters. And um, right now, if, if a bag wash is done for more than 30 minutes, or if the two filters are done at one time, and then be done for 15 minutes each, and you're done, or you start to over. That's an issue. The other issue is that there's only one tank, and you have no time to allow for settling. I think the max the city or the operators really have is about an hour, because then they have to start pumping it back to the head of the plant so they can get empty for the next wash cycle. Typically, what a facility has are two back pumps <coughs> that discharge to one while the other settling. Once it's settled, um, then what you do is you have a, a suction that floats on the top of the water and it decants the clean water to the head of the plant. All the solids fall to the bottom of the tank, and that is washed into a sump where a sludge pump pumps it either to the waste plant or it will pump it um, to the lagoons, which is what this community has here. Um, this is it is really important because right now everything drops to the center of the uh, reclaim basin, and it kind of mounds up. And so once a year, the guys go in there and with a back and shovel, and it's it's eight foot area height, but then it's got a lead in there. So you're trudging through. It's not a nice environment. And they go through there and they, they clean it out. Um, typically what we see is a, a facility where they have a wash system in it. And I'll describe that for a little bit here. Um, right now this is the pump. The only pump we have is at the bottom of the tank. So a back wash is done, sits for an hour. And then this pumps off the bottom of the tank, so it's pumping all your solids and it's pumping right to the head of the plant again. So it's going right to the head, right through the facility again. Um, you really don't want this, because what you're doing is you're, you're really stressing the plant out. You're sending all that dirty water right back. Typically what you do is you have that decant system, so you send the clean water back. And so what we're recommending here is, is to divide the tank you have into two. So you have two tanks there and then to extend it outside the building so you can increase the size so that you can use one side, you can take one down um, either for maintenance or for settling so then you can reclaim clean water back to the head of the plant and you can have the dirty water settle out and be sent to where it needs to be sent. Um, and 
also a part of this as we looked at because of the slope in front of the building on that south side we could relocate the overflow so if there is an overflow rather than flowing into the basement of the water plant where you have the blower you have um, pumps you have a lot of electrical equipment they could go outside the facility and that really is preferred because your whole electrical room is on that bottom floor of the water plant so if that were to flood you you lose all your electrical um, and so again, this is put as a high priority just because of the risk. And if you're putting new media in, if you're putting new media in, you want to try to maintain it so you don't have to replace it again. You want it to last as long as possible. And um, you know, here I discussed a spray wash system. When we do uh, reclaim base, and we look at having the sides that are sloped and then wash system, so it washes all the solids to the center of the tank, and then it pushes it down to a sump area. And about every third cycle, then the solids are emptied um, to the lagoons or to the sanitary system, and the clean water is decanted to the front of the plant. It's just very efficient. That's almost all plants operate nowadays. Um, the recycle pumps do have EFDs on them typically too, so that the 10% flow, um, the Minnesota Department of Health wants that maintained to 10% of whatever your incoming flow is. So if you have 2,000 gallons of them coming in, we have 200 gallons max going to the head of the plant, and that's just because you don't want it to send too um, many solids to the head of the plant, because it does uh, upset the treatment ability. And then this is just kind of a drawing what I was talking about, is your existing tank is, is right here, putting a divider wall there, <coughs> and then sloping the walls to a low channel area, and this channel area you dump into a pit area, and this pit area is where you have one or two backwash pumps that pump it out, um, you pump it, to either to your lagoons um, or to the sanitary sewer. And then the recycle pumps, one for each tank, and those would send it up to the head of the plant. They get redundancy, so if one goes down, you always have a system fall back up on it. Here were modifications. This isn't something we looked into, but in 2010, we had a study done. And in that study, they did have some recommendations for the roof of this circular um, 750,000 gallon clear well. The roof here does have a little bit of a, of a downslope to it where you can have water ponding. And the issue with that is that if you have drinking water, you don't want to have it ponding down or having cracks develop. It does have a membrane there, but you really want to have the water running off of it. And so they did make some recommendations for just putting a new roofing system on it that would cause the water to run off of it rather than stay on it. And then they also did make some recommendations in that that there are four pounds supporting this, this structure of the roof and that it be um, protected against moisture at these joints and cracks from further erosion. And so they did make some recommendations for sealing that at the very top. The fluoride system, again, this is pretty minor. Um, the majority of the chemical feed systems are operating beautifully. We have very nice systems working very, very well. Um, this one, we're just recommending that you put a brake tank in here and a second pump um, just so you can do the siphoning of fluoride into the system. It's a requirement that it Department of Health, um, and it's something that can easily be done. It's a very, these pumps are very inexpensive, so you are looking at a few thousand dollars for, for that entire work, so it's very, very minor, and it's something that can be done in house. <coughs> and again, I did talk about this just you know, briefly a little bit of the supervisory control data acquisition system, um, is that we did see going through the chemical feed when we were doing the calculations that there is some deficiency in the system, it should be upgraded. And it just kind of backed up, but I think the previous studies had shown is that the SCADA system does need to be replaced. It's, it's not recording what's actually happening out there. And so that is a, a I think a replacement in 2018. And lagoon modifications, these lagoons have been there for well over 40 years. Um, if you've been out there, you've noticed that they started out pretty narrow with a four to one slope and they've gotten wider and wider and wider. They have a one to one slope now <laughs> and the top of the dike where the road is, it's, it's pretty narrow. In the winter, I'd be a little worried about going off it and I think um, what we're looking at here is we need to restore some of the slope there. We need to re, re um, grade that so we can get some of that back so it isn't such a narrow driveway. Um, we have a rope going all around with all the dikes. Um, we did look at what if we were to put concrete floor slabs into the five lagoons that are out there, what would that cost? It was 1.3 million, and we thought, no, that's just too much. We thought it'd be really nice, it'd be very easy to clean, 
Granite Falls does theirs that way. They just have a, a truck that comes in, they just scrape right along the bottom and they haul it out. They don't go any deeper because they hit concrete and it just slides. It's very, very nice. But because you have five lagoons, it's a lot of area. It's a lot of money. So we're looking at what, 1.3 million. So we said, no, probably not. Let's just go back to restoring the lakes. And that might be something that could be done in house. Um, so it's one of the things that we really recommend that gets done just for safety for driving on the dikes. And then the other thing is, um, what we have noticed is, I don't know if you want to call it being too efficient, that back about three years ago, the sludge produced, um, from your clarifiers, there's, there's sludge taken off the bottom that's pumped out to these lagoons. Over the last, oh, probably 2010, 2011, 2012, about 95,000 gallons per day were sent to the, to the lagoons as, as waste, as far as just had solids and sent out there. Um, it was in, I think, it was November of 20, 2014, in May, September, in that area. All of a sudden, this dropped to 15,300. You know, it's a considerable drop, and it's never gone up. We have looked everywhere for it. At first, when it first happened, we were talking to Dwayne about it, it's like, Something's wrong with your clarifier. It's not being pulled out your clarifier. You know, it's not there. Looked at it. No, it wasn't there. We looked everywhere. What we think has happened is um, they have optimized the plant such that with the polymer that they're feeding, their solids are much, much thicker. You don't have as much water in the solids anymore. And so it's, it's much more efficient. It's working really well. And the operators have said they've had the solids dropping up nicer than they ever have. It's in the best water they've ever had in the last year or two. And this just kind of shows this is where it is. This is water, whereas this is more solids, much less water, and the solids are being pumped out to the ponds. The problem with that is that because you don't have as much water to neutralize it, the pH is rising out there. And the permit requires the pH stay below 9. The clarifiers have a pH of 10 or 11 because of the line that's being added. So we're looking at out here, um, you know, we're awfully close to the limit, to the upper limit, and so we really need to get some kind of a a chemical fee system out there to drop that pH prior to it going to the creek. And this is something too that, that could be done in house or through a contractor, it'd be fairly easy to do. And so, what I did is I highlighted the items that were considered um, high priority and the cost for each. So, the replacement of the aerator, a little over $200,000, the clarifier, replace, repair, launders. Um, for the two, you're looking at about $77,000. Filter rehab, just over $2 million. That's the big one. And then the backwash replay modifications, at just under $1.3 million. Those are the four that we really um, picked out as being high priority for operation of the facility. The other items are important, but they can either be done um, in-house or over time or added to it later. But we really wanted to look at, you know, what, what is something that really should be done. And what we did is we broke it down into phases. Um, and so the first phase one is the filter rehab. Um, and that's just because of the condition of, of the metal, the valves, the, <coughs> the nozzles. It just kind of goes on and on. Um, the majority of that system really does need to be replaced. Um, phasing, phase two is the backwash reclaim. Um, if you're going to be putting new media and new nozzles and you really want to protect it, so you want to make sure that you can clean it properly. And that's providing enough storage for the backwash water, and then also returning the cleaner water, not returning the solids right back to the facility, removing it from the system. And then finally, um, phase three is replacement of the aerator, and then the clarifier repair and replacement of launders. And um, <clears throat> I just put in an implementation schedule for phase one. Um, if we're looking at staying with this 2016, 2017, um, schedule, how it breaks out is starting with design uh, in the bid documents in September and then submitting to the Minnesota Department of Health for a review and approval in February. Um, assuming that, that they take about one month review, then be authorizing projects to bid in March um, and then awarding the, the bid in, in April so they can start in the spring with the operations of uh, the construction. And you're looking at having the project completed um, and closed out in June of 2017. So it is a long project um, process here. You're looking two years out for the overall the design, the bidding, and the construction. So it is a fairly long process. I hope I didn't bore you all to death. <laughs> I love the technology behind it. <laughs> but um, 
Any questions at all? What do they do when you replace the filter, filter water while it's down? What we would do is, um, the reason we have it scheduled this way is that in the spring is when it be, you get out, contractors get started, you know, probably around May is when they get started. And what they would be doing is they would be ordering materials, um, shop drawings so we can review and make sure they're providing the right things. And then they put the materials to come in. And some of those items take 12 to 16 weeks to get. And what we really want them to do is do the installation in the winter. Um, so what we're looking at is a fall, winter, when, when the flows are down, when consumption is down. Because then what we can do is we can switch to two filters instead of having all four in operation. So what we would be doing is some temporary piping and we would have half of the filters online, the other half would be down, and kind of did the, the um, we have some drawings just kind of show the, the phasing of it. But what you do is you do two of them, upgrade that, and then you'd have to switch over. And so it, it is a, a process. It's a little tricky, too. We wouldn't be drinking bad water, in other words. No, in fact, when I was at Rural Water, was it three years ago? You guys had the best water. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, leave it go. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any preventive maintenance we could do or could have done? Are, are the inspections rather pricey or, or what's the deal? Because as I hear, the last time it was checked 20 years ago and you know, this is the biggest one I've ever, my ball I've ever seen. And you know, some I, of those things are a little alarming, is there? You know, I think part of the reason that, um, that, that calcium buildup is there, and, and it isn't the whole reason, but it's part of it is that um, you want to keep your um, lead and copper rules. You don't want to have the lead out in the system, so you're trying to keep the pH a little bit higher. And when that pH is a little bit higher, you're going to have some, um, that recarb is going to settle on and settling out on your filters. If that could be dropped a little bit, the trade-off is you drop it, you'll have less um, forming on your filters, but then you're going to have to add a, like a polyphosphate so that you don't have the the copper and lead issues in your system. Well, the problem with polyphosphates is that your wastewater plant, you have a phosphorus limit. So you're really doing the right thing. Um, you know, one thing that I think we should look at is, is making sure we got that pH as low as we can go without creating an issue um, with, with the lead and copper. And maybe there can be a small adjustment there, but I think it's set right now where the Department of Health wanted it set. Right. Yeah. Okay, then one other question as we talk about all the inefficiencies are occurring because of these problems, uh, you know, the, the residents are always going to ask return on investment. Is there any calculation <coughs> done on ROI as far as as we fix these things and replace them? And you know, it's bound to save us. You guys something. have done really well. I mean, your maintenance system has been pretty good because typically these filters you see a complete recall in 20 years. You're looking at 40 years, so you really have done really, really well. Any other questions? Good for now. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. City Administrator, Lori or Greg, you will fun there. Okay. Um, as you all know, there was a, um, a, a, a there's a function agreement with the City Administrator, um, potential City Administrator. And one of the things that we needed to look at was the pay schedule or setting the, the, uh, the pay for that range. It was advertised at the 88266 to, I think it was 108, if I remember correctly. Um, so tonight on your agenda, we actually have the salary schedule, which I don't have it Anybody have any questions about the agreement? Right? No, um, just that uh, 
it's up for approval tonight by the council and the contract is in there and, and uh, everything else. And I'm sure everybody's ready to vote for it. I thought <coughs> negotiating went extremely well, and uh, Mr. Rademacher, uh, I think it's a, a fair, very fair deal for the city. And I spoke with Mr. Rademacher. I did get a, a letter from a city administrator from Canby, who I guess it's 26 miles away or whatever, where the gentleman said that he was very lucky that we got an awesome man. And this is after the fact, this wasn't before the fact. And said he's going to need to see more because they have great working relationships. So I just look at it for a very positive for the city. And as Jeremy and I look over the contract, I think everything was very fair. Thank you. Yep, no, I Everything went well. I guess uh, could have been a lot more back and forth, but he was pretty understanding and willing to work, work with us. So I think all was well, and we got ourselves a good candidate. Any so employment agreement? Did anybody have any questions on that at all? Was it consistent to be at top of? Pay scale in five years? Um, that is actually, I think, the, the main thing they asked me are at top of pay scale in four years. I think there's five steps. Um, the 49ers are in two years, and the police, I believe, are in six years or something of that nature. So it's, it's very comparable to what we have for the majority of Any other questions? Golf course. Okay. And, and I would add, I mean, that was one of the things when we did our last pay equity report. One of the things that we were tagged on is that it did. We used to have like a 15 or 16 step schedule for some of the employees, and that was one of the things that um, we were found not in compliance with is because we had such a spread in our employees getting to the top of the pay scale. You know, some were there in two years, and some it took. <laughs> golf course status, Greg? Uh, golf course status, we have advertising ongoing for uh, permanent replacement uh, for the golf superintendent. That closes on the 31st. Uh, at that point, we'll start to look at interviews for that. Um, you probably see in front of you, we do have a recommendation for additional hire for the groundskeeper, um, but we still need some additional help in the clubhouse. So I would say if anybody knows of anybody that would be interested in helping us out, bartending and such, let us know. Uh, we, can, we can look at that. Right now, we are extremely short-handed, so we may have to look at doing something in, uh, in September as far as uh, restricting the hours just because of the limited staff. But um, yeah, overall, I'd say revenue-wise, we're looking good for, for the golf course this year. We're kind of on course with the 2011 2012 uh, year, so we're looking, we're looking okay there. Um, but obviously, we want to get some help so we can take advantage of the September uh, time frame as well. How many, have, how many applications have we had for the uh, superintendent post so far? We've had, I think, three full applications, um, but we've had probably in the 20s in terms of uh, inquiries, you know, people sending us their resume. But we were responded to them and have to fill out the actual application that the city has uh, in order to, to qualify for it. So um, we had quite a bit of interest in it. Um, I just look forward to them uh, actually filling out the application and formally submitting uh, what they need. Any idea about how many hours they're looking for for, say, a bartender? Um, we'll take if somebody's willing to work, you know, one day a week. That's that's fine. Um, you know. We have currently two people that would be looking in the, in the bartender area. Um, so if we can find somebody that would be willing to do one day a week and we get four of them, that would be, that would be great. In addition to that, we did receive um, an application for um, the, the, the grounds crew, the outside grounds crew. So that is one thing we wanted to add to the agenda tonight was approval of hiring that person. Um, 
we could have one one of our outside people is gone already for the season. Another one is leaving. I believe next this week is his last week. So we're down to um, one full time and then the two part time guys out there. They, they just can't keep up with the and um, you know keep the course up and everything. So um, I think I did hand out tonight. We could add that to the agenda. And you can add, yeah, yeah. add it to the consent is item W. Thank <laughs> you. 